Okay, IED, since we've been going on the subject of reverse engineering, we need to take a little bit of time and talk about the way to look at an object and dissect it visually. So we're going to start the topic of visual analysis and we're going to talk about some key points about looking at an object and seeing what an object actually um, is composed of whenever you take a look at it in detail. I've got a bunch of stuff over on my uh, desk and all of this stuff can be used to visually analyze things. We're going to just specifically look at some individual details. Whenever you're making something, the first thing that we want to look at is just like the basic geometry of the objects themselves. And the basic geometry comes down to uh, points, lines, and those points and lines can end up making shapes just like you've learned in geometry class. Um, you know, triangles, circles, squares, all of that different stuff. So points in general for an object are places that are uh, interesting like specific points about that object itself and one of the ways the easiest ways to find points is to look at objects that have lines that intersect with each other so if you have three lines that intersect with each other then the end at those uh, the end point of that location that that edge or that vertex that's going to be, uh, those are specific points at the end of that. And technically, there could be a point at any location in uh, this object, for example, but only specific points in terms of visual analysis are going to be important. So the edges of the object have points on them, and those edges are going to be important to us in consideration. Now, we also talk about lines, so I'm going to keep this thing out here for just a second. And this object looks, you know, it's a box. This is courtesy of, uh, let's see, I can't remember where I got this from. Maybe this was courtesy of the U.S. Postal Service that was giving out uh, all of their old router switches. So this is where all your internets come from. You you know have this hooked up to the main line and you can network your computers up to it. This box is not very appealing. It looks like a flat out box, incredibly functional, uh, but we're gonna use this as a couple of examples of design because there are design principles that even go into something as mundane as a box. The uh, There are a lot of horizontal and vertical lines here and horizontal and vertical lines are, they have properties of their own. You know, uh, they are usually, you know, meant to be sleek, efficient, and they don't necessarily cause a lot of profile to your object. However, there are other things like diagonal lines and curved lines that make a really, really big difference in your object. So this is a box as well, but this box has a little bit of curve to it as well. So there's lines, sure, but there's also some curved parts of it as well. So this line, if we were to look at it, has a curve that goes all the way around. This isn't really an edge by itself. This is just a fillet. And because of that, the object looks a little bit more aesthetic it looks a little bit more appealing to it so adding a couple of different like horizontal lines or vertical lines or curved lines can increase the aesthetic appeal of an object and sometimes people buy that just based on aesthetic appeal alone they don't even look at the function of the object itself uh, curved lines are lines that are not straight so a couple of examples of lines that are not straight so if you look at this flashlight you can tell that this area right here if you look at the side profile this area is curved and that could have a functional purpose or it could also have an aesthetic purpose um, let's see here this tape is a curved line all the way around and once again that could have a visual purpose or that could actually have some kind of purpose in and of itself. Uh, this flying pig has a curve to it. You know, obviously, if you're going to look at something that is supposed to kind of look organic, then it's going to have some kind of curve that goes along to it. Okay, um, and so usually whenever you add those curved lines, it ends up looking a little bit more sleek um, and less functional. It looks a little bit more like it was um, dynamic, I think is probably a better word. Okay, now let's go ahead and talk about uh, the colors of an object. So colors, uh, there's lots of different ways that we can talk about color in and of itself, specifically dealing with objects. Uh, you know, there are cool temperatures and warm temperatures of color, So, and, and that can actually make a really big difference and how you interpret the object. So I have these tolerance blocks that we've actually used in class and they, even though they're exactly the same in terms of the actual uh, shape and function, they look very, very different from each other. And you can actually, uh, 
the, the, the setup, like these are, these are going to appear different to us. And since they appear different to us, we can interpret these a little bit different, even though the shape of them is exactly the same. This one does actually look a little bit more aggressive and this one looks a little bit more calming and, and assuring. Like, you know, this is like the, the 8 AM, uh, you know, regular, just vibing tolerance block and this one is like the I ate like or I drank 15 Red Bulls and I'm just like going at it so you know this is the calm tolerance block and this is the aggressive tolerance block the powerful tolerance block or something like that okay um, so th the color that you decide to make something will actually make a difference in how the product is perceived and you know there's also some other things you have to keep in mind too like cultural uh, connotations historical connotations and popular connotations of color as well too there's not really objects that deal with like cultural I mean there is but uh, I'm, I'm mainly thinking like, you know, whenever you talk about a marriage, it, depending on where you're from, that concept of, of how you would actually dress up in terms of colors makes a difference depending on where you are. Um, birth and death rights. So like, for example, if you say it's a boy or it's a girl, there are colors that are associated to that. And if you use different colors, people are going to have a hard time interpreting what you're saying. Like if you say it's a boy and use a bunch of green balloons outside, people are going to be like um okay that's uh, all right um you know and then like the you know funerals and stuff like that there are a certain uh cultural colors that are used with that and it's not always black and white uh historical connotations you know flag designs and affiliations by countries and militaries normally use uh colors to go along with that uh, there are also definitely popular connotations of color as well too. So for video games and like the Among Us craze that's going on in 2020, a lot of people say red is sus and you know that's usually if you look at an Among Us game, uh, the, the color scheme, red usually gets kicked out more often statistically and that might actually just be because of our interpretations of colors. Uh, if you normally think of a sports car, normally in your mental image that you get, it's normally going to be some kind of aggressive color in your mind. Normally when people think of a sports car, they're not like, oh, I'm thinking of this wonderful beige sports car or, or look at that brown Ferrari that doesn't really work. Normally whenever you make those, they put design choices in those to make those aggressive or warm colors. Uh, any logos will have color connotations to them. So anything that's made with the commercials, like if you think about the McDonald's logo, the McDonald's logo is specifically designed to catch your eye. Uh, most of them uh, have those color choices meticulously picked out for very specific reasons. Okay, and the value of an object. So the value can either relate to using light, light or dark to create some kind of uh, depth perception uh, with an object. And I'm not really having a good example of this on my I guess I'll just use this motor. The motor is made of mainly dark colors, so the the value of this motor is going to have a, you know a much much different color of value than say this white uh, cap. So like the value difference between this, this is a very light object, and then on the motor this is a very very dark object. So the values uh, that can be used to create depth, you know, is that lightness and darkness. And you can use this lightness and darkness to give the appearance of three-dimensional looks like this, even if it's not a three-dimensional object. So this is on a flat sheet of paper, but you're using lightness and darkness values to create this kind of like three-dimensional um, example, yeah, this three-dimensional representation of an object in reality. So even though this is flat on the surface, we can kind of see the shadows and the light that comes off of it. So the lighter areas would re would give you like light reflection and the darker areas would represent like shadows. Okay, so you'd have a lighter area on top. This is imagining that the light is coming in from the top value and or from the top of the object. And this is an example of how you can use value in an object. So you can either use it as lightness or darkness for the value or in a 2D sense you can also use value to create uh, an illusion of 3D even though it's on a two-dimensional object. We'll continue this later but these are the first basic points for visual analysis. The points, the lines, colors, and values. Uh, I'll talk to you guys later. Have a great day.